This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 94. Coming up on Space Time, NASA's InSight lander touches down on the red planet, the oldest star in the neighbourhood, and what caused the last ice age. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Mars InSight spacecraft has landed successfully on the Elysium Planetia, a broad, freeze-dried plain just north of the red planet's equator. The InSight lander separated from its cruise stage, which had carried the mission from Earth to Mars, at approximately 6.40 on Tuesday morning, Australian Eastern Summer Time. That was 11.40am on Monday, US Pacific Standard Time, and 19.40 in the evening on Monday, Greenwich Mean Time. Just a minute later, InSight turned to orient the spacecraft properly for atmospheric entry, hitting the upper Martian atmosphere six minutes later at some 19,800 kilometres per hour, as it commenced ADL, which to mission managers marked seven minutes of hell. All stations and systems, we can confirm we are entry minus 20 minutes. EDL NAV2 has been initiated. The star tracker has been powered off. The NAV2 software has been initially initiated. So when we're in cruise, we use a star tracker in a similar manner to how um, sailors navigated years ago. We look at the stars and get our relative position from them. And we use a star tracker for that. And now that we're close enough to Mars, we don't need that anymore. So we're going to transition to what's called NAV2 software. And that lets us basically just uh, use velocity and acceleration from this point on. So we don't need the star tracker anymore. Uh, Mark will clarify. Slew to inertial or started bent pipe? Slew to appropriate attitude for bent pipe. Bent pipe mode will be entered shortly. Okay, thank you very much. And that was obviously our confirmation of the slew for Marco, so that's great news. At this time, MRO has, will have loaded their electro sequences. Uh, Marco is expecting carrier lock uh, at any time. Marco B is reported there in bent pipe, still waiting on A. Copy that, thank you. Radio science report UHF carrier detected. EDL con, Marco Bravo. Marco Alpha is in bent pipe mode. Marco Bravo has locked on the carrier. Marco Alpha has also locked on carrier. System based on inside cord. As expected, the DSN has LOS for inside expansion. Copy that. All station inside systems on inside cord. DSN has lost the expanse signal from inside indicated expected cruise stage separation. Standing by for UHF signal acquisition via Marco or Radio Science. We are about five minutes from entry and have confirmation we've lost the X-band signal from InSight. This was expected because we have transitioned from the antenna on the cruise stage to the UHF antenna on board the spacecraft. Ground stations have detected the UHF signal and Marco has locked on the signal. This confirms that InSight is transmitting UHF signals as expected. InSight telemetry through the Marco relay is not expected until about two minutes before entry. Space now crap. receiving InSight telemetry via the Marco relay. Ah, it's, it's flowing into the space. That means the team now can watch the data flowing onto their screens as if they're commuting directly this data to the will provide detailed information about the state of the spacecraft throughout EDL. We were on pins and needles waiting for that because we weren't really sure. Uh, this is wonderful news. Uh, this, this will allow us to give some, uh, if this continues working uh, all the way to the ground and beyond, uh, we might even see a, a first picture from the surface of Mars. Wouldn't that be great? Very soon. Atmospheric entry on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Here we go. So in a few seconds, the vehicle will start sensing the atmosphere. I said 35, 22 kilometers from the center of Mars. And it's going to start to slow down very, very slowly at first, but then faster and faster and faster till, uh, to, to reach us about 7 Gs. And so it, it will, it, but we'll still very, very quickly slow down. In approximately one minute, InSight is expected to reach its maximum heating rate. Oh, yes. Plasma blackout is possible during peak heating and could cause a temporary dropout of telemetry. 
This could last for as long as two minutes. The, the gas that comes off the heat shield as it's slowing down, it looks like a meteor if you're on Mars watching the streak go by. That brightness of gas does interfere with the radio reception. And so it's possible that uh, Marco will lose that signal while it's going through this very hot entry. Not to be alarmed, it's, it's part of the design. We, we, we completely expect it. Radio science reports plasma blackout as expected. Ground stations have reported plasma blackout. Still receiving insight telemetry via Marco. Marco Alpha has carrier interruption. Within two minutes of entering the red planet's atmosphere, InSight's protective heat shield reached temperatures of over 1,500 degrees Celsius. The extreme deceleration and intense heating causing a temporary radio signal dropout. InSight should now be experiencing the peak heating rate. Portions of the heat shield may reach nearly 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit as it protects the lander from the heating environment. Awesome. Marco Province shows carrier interruption but still in lock. InSight has passed through peak deceleration. Telemetry shows the spacecraft saw about 8 G. Marco Alpha and Marco Bravo maintain lock. Radio science reports carrier detected. The site is now traveling at a velocity of 2,000 meters per second. The next event is parachute deploy. InSight is now traveling at 1,000 meters per second. Once InSight slows to about 400 meters per second, it will deploy its 12-meter diameter supersonic parachute. The parachute will deploy nominally at about Mach 1.7. Standing by for parachute deploy. Radio science reports a sudden change in Doppler. Ground stations are observing signals consistent with parachute deploy. Then at 11.51 a.m. U.S. Pacific Standard Time, InSight's parachute was deployed, followed 15 seconds later by the separation of the Shield, and 10 seconds after that, the deployment of the landing gear. Just a minute later, the spacecraft's radar activated to determine InSight's altitude above the Martian surface. Marco Alpha, Marco Bravo, maintain lock status. Telemetry shows parachute deployment. Radar powered on. Heat shield separation commanded. We have radar activation where the radar is beginning to search for the ground. Once the radar locks on the ground and InSight is about one kilometer above the surface, the lander will separate from the backshell and begin terminal descent using its 12 descent engine. The probe's backshell and parachute then jettisoned, and its descent engines began firing to begin a gravity turn designed to get the lander into its proper orientation for touchdown and then slow the spacecraft down to a constant velocity of just 8 kilometers per hour for a soft landing. Altitude convergence, the radar has locked on the ground. Yes! Standing by for lander separation. Carrier interruption on Marco Alpha and Marco Bravo. Lander separation commanded. Yes. Altitude 600 meters. Gravity turn. Altitude 400 meters. 300 meters. 200 meters. 80 meters. 60 meters. 50 meters. Constant velocity. 37 meters. 30 meters. 20 meters. 17 meters. Standing by for touchdown. Touchdown confirmed. Wow. This never gets old. No, it doesn't, Rob. Um, uh, control room just erupted. Fabulous, fabulous. Hands with the Marco, the Marco team Marcos. there. Marcos team, you did great. <laughs> what a relief. We've cut over to the camera over in Times Square. Boy, people are weathering the rain to see this. Mission managers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, were able to confirm the successful touchdown 146 million kilometres away thanks to a pair of tiny CubeSats known as Mars Cube Ones or Marcos, which followed InSight on its six-month journey to the Red Planet. The twin CubeSats, each no bigger than a briefcase, relayed signals from InSight during its entry, descent and landing, or ADL, right down to the surface of the red planet. NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the Mars Odyssey Orbiter also recorded and relayed data during the ADL maneuver. About 12 hours prior to the critical entry, descent and landing phase, NASA's Deep Space Communications Network Canberra Tracking Station, together with the European Space Agency's new Norcia Tracking Station north of Perth, were used to confirm final target correction manoeuvres before the spacecraft entered the Martian atmosphere. 
The CSIRO's Glenn Nagel from NASA's Canberra Deep Space Tracking Station says it was a critical time for the spacecraft as InSight lined up for Martian atmospheric entry. Hours before the actual landing on Mars, we had this final contact with the spacecraft confirming for the mission control team that it was on course, that the final course correction manoeuvre had gone flawlessly. It was on target to be able to arrive at that tiny little window in space, just 10 kilometres wide, 24 kilometres uh, high, and it had to hit that precise window after what was nearly a half a billion kilometre voyage to be able to land at the exact right spot on the surface of Mars. And maths and physics took over, and it all worked perfectly. They call it seven minutes of hell. How did you guys feel? I mean, sitting back watching what was going on. Yeah, it was really a goosebump sort of moment as you listen, particularly to the mission control people, knowing that data is travelling in through our sister station in Spain, and fingers crossed that everything was going okay there, and then listening to that count-off as they went, yeah, the spacecraft is sending, it's now 50 metres, 37 metres, 20 metres, 10 metres... <gasps> Touchdown. <laughs> and that the long room gap. Erupted. And yeah, that long was, gap, that, that was just breathtaking. Yeah, that really was the hold your breath moment. Was it there? Was it okay? And they had to wait to get that absolute confirmation for the spacecraft to basically say, I am here. And, of course, all those signals also being relayed not only directly back to Earth, but through two unique spacecraft, uh, the CubeSats that were flying along with, but, yeah, with the InSight mission. The signal acquisition from Marcos was also quite exciting. Yeah, these two little remarkable spacecraft, not much bigger than a small briefcase, flying along uh, with the InSight mission across its half a billion kilometre voyage to Mars. And they were there to relay the signal as the spacecraft descended and then landed on the surface. And they worked perfectly. I don't think anybody expected them to do as well as they did. And literally relaying a signal back to Earth that when we received through the Deep Space Network was about a billion times weaker than the power that your mobile phone uses. And these are little CubeSats. It's the first time they've done an interplanetary mission. Yes, yeah, so that was the whole purpose of this. It was to send these two CubeSats to see if they could be used in deep space. We've got plenty of them orbiting around the Earth now, but deep space is where they could really be useful for our exploration exploration of the outer planets because they can operate successfully, go on these long journeys and send back these signals from anywhere in the solar system, we can use them as an interplanetary internet. So spacecraft could then store and forward their information to those relay CubeSats and then those CubeSats can store and forward that information home. So we're no longer limited by line of sight. So just like the way we have communication satellites around the Earth relaying signals all across the planet, we could use these little CubeSats everywhere and they're relatively low cost compared to the larger costs of the big missions themselves that go on land or orbit it somewhere, you can send lots of these out and replace them quite easily to do that communication hub across the solar system. The deep space internet sounds fascinating. Yeah, I mean, this spacecraft, these two spacecraft, Marco A, Marco B, although they got nicknamed uh, Wally and Eva out of the, the Disney Pixar movie, <laughs> we always like to nickname them. We, some people wanted them to be Marco and Polo, but... <laughs> But the two Marco spacecraft, they really did perform flawlessly. There were a few little hiccups along the way, but they seemed to overcome the, any issues that they did have and then came to this moment of sending these signals back from Mars. They even had their own cameras on board and it was delightful to actually see pictures as they were then departing Mars. They're just flying past the planet now and actually take their own pictures back as Mars sort of disappears off into the distance. And what happens with InSight now? It's on the surface. Uh, what are its first functions? And, uh, and, and what will its bigger mission be? So the expectation is for the first 40 days, it's all about system checkouts, making sure the spacecraft is healthy. Uh, they'll also be using the cameras on board the spacecraft to be able to characterise the environment around the lander itself. What sort of rocks are in the way? Are there any hazards? Where would be the best place to deploy that incredibly sensitive seismometer onto the surface and to deploy the heat probe, which will need to penetrate using a little hammer drill at several metres underground to look at the temperature gradient below the planet as well. So uh, first a few weeks are all about system checkouts and seeing how we're going to run the rest of the mission. At this stage, uh, certainly the press conference has indicated that the first science might not be returned from the seismometer until early next year. And what will InSight be doing on the surface? So it's literally, this is just a lander, not a rover this time driving around, but a lander with an incredibly sensitive seismometer. This seismometer can measure vibrations as small as half the width of a hydrogen atom. 
It's the most incredibly sensitive instrument that we've ever seen anywhere else in the solar system. And literally, if somebody was to, well, not somebody, but some a rock was to drop on one side of the planet, it will pick up the vibrations on the other side of Mars where inside is located. And also to learn about the interior of the planet. We, we've orbited Mars. We've taken studies of the atmosphere. We've looked at the surface. We've had rovers drive around and study some rocks in the soil and scratch the surface a little bit. This is a chance to look underneath Mars, to look at the engine of the planet, to look at everything from the crust down to the core. Is the core still hot? Is it spinning? Is it generating any kind of magnetic field, even if it's just a weak one? What is the mantle like? Is there geologic activity? Could there be Mars quakes? We have earthquakes here, Mars quakes there. So signs of geologic activity at the planet. What is the subsurface crust like? Could there be voids? Are there underground rivers, lakes? Are there places where life could get a foothold? So all of these things are going to allow us to put together information from the orbiters, the rovers, and now inside to get a top to bottom view of the entire planetary system. As well as NASA's constellation of Mars orbiters, ESA's Mars Express and ExoMars TGO orbiters also assisted by relaying communications back to Earth as needed. Its Elysium Planetia landing site is an ellipse approximately 130 kilometres long and 27 kilometres wide, centred at about 4.5 degrees north Martian latitude and 136 degrees east Martian longitude just southwest of the Elysium Mons volcano and to the north of Gale Crater, where the Curiosity rover is currently operating. InSight's first task, once safely on the ground, was to release its solar panels, then capture an initial landing shot of its surroundings and to make sure nothing's fallen off that shouldn't have, and then the deployment of its instruments. NASA's Mars Interior Exploration, using Seismic Investigations, Geodesy and Heat Transport, or InSight mission, is the first probe designed to directly study the interior of another planet. It will study the structure of the Martian deep interior, allowing scientists to better understand the formation and evolution of the red planet. InSight was launched aboard an Atlas V rocket on May 5, 2018, from Space Launch Complex 3 East at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. It was the first interplanetary mission launched from Vandenberg. The lander is deploying two instruments directly onto the red planet's surface, using a 2.4-metre robotic instrument deployment arm. One is a seismometer, designed to measure microscopic ground motions, providing detailed information about the interior structure of Mars. The seismometer will take precise measurements of quakes and other internal activity on Mars to better understand the planet's composition and structure. It'll investigate how the Martian crust and mantle respond to the effects of meteorite impacts. The seismometer will also detect sources including atmospheric waves and gravimetric signals, that is, tidal forces exerted by the Martian moon Phobos. The seismometer is supported by a suite of meteorological tools designed to characterise atmospheric disturbances that might affect the experiment. These include a vector magnetometer to measure magnetic disturbances such as those caused by the Martian ionosphere. There's a suite of air temperature, wind speed and wind direction sensors and a barometer to measure local air pressure. The other instrument to be deployed by the robotic arm is a heat flow probe which will hammer itself some 3 to 5 metres down into the Martian soil. As it burrows down deep into the ground, it'll release a trailing tether embedded with heat sensors designed to measure temperature profiles of the subsurface and how efficiently heat flows through Mars's core and thus reveal unique information about the planet's interior and how it's evolved over time. InSight will also use its radio to measure wobbles in the planet's rotation which relate to the size of the Martian core. This X-band radio tracking is capable of an accuracy of less than 2 centimetres, building on previous data from both the Viking program and the Mars Pathfinder mission. That previous data allowed the size of the Martian core to be estimated, but with more data from InSight, it should be possible to calculate far more precisely the size and density of the Martian core and its mantle. Also aboard is a laser retroreflector instrument, which will allow passive laser range finding by orbiters even after the land is retired, and it will also function as a node for a proposed Mars geophysical network. InSight is also equipped with two cameras, an instrument deployment camera mounted on the instrument deployment arm, which will image instruments on the lander's deck and also provide stereoscopic views of the terrain surrounding the landing site. 
and there's an instrument context camera mounted below the lander's deck which has a wide angle 120 degree panoramic field of view and will provide a complementary view of the instrument deployment area. As well as telling scientists more about the evolution of Mars, InSight will also provide new insights into the formation of terrestrial worlds throughout the solar system. The basic idea of InSight is to map out the deep structure of Mars. We know a lot about the surface of Mars, we know a lot about its atmosphere, and even about its uh, ionosphere, but we don't know very much about what goes on a mile below the surface, much less 2,000 miles below the surface down to the center. And this will be the first mission that's going to Mars specifically to investigate the deep inside of Mars. We know that the Earth is habitable, we know that Mars is not. There might be something that we find out in terms of the structure of Mars versus the structure of Earth that maybe can help us understand uh, why that is. InSight carries a seismometer which measures the seismic waves that have traveled through Mars from Mars quakes and maps out the deep interior structure of Mars. We're going to also have a heat flow and physical properties probe which will penetrate into the Mars surface about five meters or 16 feet to take the temperature of Mars. And it has a, a radio science experiment which uses the radio on the spacecraft to measure small variations in the wobble of Mars's pole to understand more about the structure and composition of the core. InSight will be the first mission to pick instruments up off the deck of the lander and place them on the surface of Mars. I like to say that we're playing the claw game on Mars with no joystick. The seismometer needs to be installed in one place and basically not move in order to get the best seismic data. We also have a wind and thermal shield that will then be placed on top of that seismometer to protect it further from the environment. For the heat flow probe, HP cubed, it also needs to sit in one place, take a while to hammer itself down into the ground and acquire the thermal measurements over a long period of time. InSight is a mission to Mars, but it's much, much more than a Mars mission. In some sense, it's like a time machine. It's measuring the structure of Mars that was put in place four and a half billion years ago, so we can go back and understand the processes that formed Mars just shortly after it was accreted from the solar nebula. By studying Mars, we'll be able to learn more about Earth, Venus, Mercury, even the Moon, even exoplanets around other stars. There you heard the voices of InSight Principal Investigator Bruce Bennett, InSight Project Manager Tom Hoffman, and InSight's Instrument Deployment Lead Scientist Jamie Singer. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Astronomers have discovered what could be the oldest star in the neighbourhood. The tiny star was found within the disk of our own Milky Way galaxy. The star, which goes by the designation of 2 Mass J1808-2002, minus 5104378b, has only about 14% the mass of our Sun, making it a spectral type M red dwarf star. Although small, the diminutive star reported in the Astrophysical Journal could have a disproportionate impact on our understanding of the age and history of the Milky Way galaxy. It also provides a unique glimpse into the conditions present in the universe shortly after the Big Bang. That's because the star has some very interesting characteristics. In addition to being small and old, most significantly, it's made of material very similar to that spewed out in the original Big Bang. And to host a star like this suggests that the disk of our galaxy could be up to 3 billion years older than previously thought. The study's lead author, Kevin Schlaufman from Johns Hopkins University, says our Sun likely descended from thousands of generations of short-lived massive stars that have lived and died since the Big Bang. However, what's most interesting about this star is that it had perhaps just one ancestor separating it from the very beginning of everything. Big Bang theory dates our universe to about 13.8 billion years and suggest that the first stars were made almost exclusively out of hydrogen and helium, primary elements created in the Big Bang. Practically all the other elements on the periodic table were produced by those first stars, either while they lived or when they died. As stars die and gradually recycle their materials into new generations of stars, heavier and heavier elements are formed. Astronomers refer to all the elements on the periodic table other than hydrogen and helium as metals, and so stars which lack heavy elements are considered to be low-metallicity stars. 
But Schlafman says this one has such low metallicity, it's really an ultra-metal poor star, a star that may be just 1 in 10 million. The star could also challenge assumptions on what the first stars in the universe were like. These so-called Population 3 stars were all thought to be massive blue giants, and therefore very short-lived. Yet here we have a star which may be just one generation removed from those first stars, and rather than another spectral type O or B blue star, this one's a spectral type M red dwarf. In addition, its location within the usually active and crowded disk of our galaxy is also unexpected. Usually all the older stars seem to reside in a galactic halo surrounding the Milky Way. This star is part of a binary system. It's the smaller companion of a larger low metallicity star observed in 2014 and 2015 by the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope. Before the discovery of this tiny red dwarf star, astronomers had mistakenly believed that this binary system might contain a black hole, a neutron star. Then, from April 2016 through to July 2017, Schlafman and colleagues used the Gemini South Telescope and the Magellan Clay Telescope, both in Chile, to dissect the star system's light and measure the object's relative motions, in the process discovering the tiny star, which was detected through its tiny gravitational tug on its partner. While an average-sized yellow dwarf star like our Sun may live for around 12 billion years, red dwarfs can burn for literally trillions of years. In fact, no red dwarf star that has ever existed has yet died of old age throughout the entire history of the universe. Although if small enough, they may lose enough mass to become brown dwarfs. But Schlafman says this star's aged well and looks exactly the same today as what it did when it formed 13.5 billion years ago. The discovery of 2 mass J1808-2002-5104378b 5104 gives astronomers hope of finding more of these old stars, which provide a glimpse of the very early universe. And that's important, because so far only about 30 ultra-metal poor stars have ever been identified. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Earth's latest ice age may have been caused by changes deep inside the planet. Based on evidence from the Pacific Ocean, including the position of the Hawaiian Islands, geophysicists have determined that Earth shifted relative to its spin axis within the past 12 million years. In the process, causing Greenland to move far enough towards the North Pole to kick off the ice age, that began about 3.2 million years ago. The findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, is based on an analysis of fossil signatures from deep ocean sediments, the magnetic signature of the oceanic crust, and the position of the mantle hotspot that created the Hawaiian Islands. The findings suggest that Earth spun steadily for millions of years, before shifting relative to its spin axis, an effect geophysicists refer to as true polar wonder. One of the study's authors, Daniel Woodworth from Rice University, says the Hawaiian hotspot was fixed relative to the spin axis from about 48 million years ago until about 12 million years ago, but it was fixed at a latitude further north than where it is today. By comparing the Hawaiian hotspot to the rest of the Earth, Woodworth and his co-author, Professor Richard Gordon, also from Rice, could see that the shift in the location was reflected in the rest of the Earth and superimposed onto the motion of the tectonic plates. And that's telling the authors that the entire Earth moved relative to its spin axis, a case of true polar wonder. When you think about it, by volume, Earth is mostly mantle, a thick layer of solid rock flowing under intense pressure and heat. The mantle is in turn covered by a thin interlocking puzzle of rocky tectonic plates that ride on top of it, bumping and slipping past one another at seismically active boundaries. Hotspots like the one underneath Hawaii are plumes of hot, solid rock that rise up from deep within the mantle. Gordon says the new findings build on two 2017 studies, one from his lab that showed how to use hotspots as a global reference frame for tracking the movement of tectonic plates, and the other from Harvard University that first tied true polar wonder to the onset of the Ice Age. The authors use these hotspots as reference markers, tracking plumes from the deep mantle. They think the whole global network of hotspots was fixed relative to the Earth's spin axis for at least 36 million years before this shift. Like any spinning object, planet Earth is subjected to centrifugal force, which tugs on the planet's fluid interior. At the equator, where this force is strongest, the Earth is more than 42 kilometres larger in diameter than at the poles. Gordon says true polar wonder can occur when dense, highly viscous bumps in the mantle build up at latitudes away from the equator. He says it's just like pouring cold syrup on hot pancakes. 
As you pour the syrup, you temporarily have a little pile at the centre, where it doesn't instantly flatten out because of the viscosity of the cold syrup. Gordon and Woodward think the dense anomalies in the mantle are like that little temporary pile of cold syrup, only the viscosities are much higher in the lower mantle. And just like the syrup, it will eventually deform, but it takes a really, really, really long time to do so. If these mantle anomalies are massive enough, they can unbalance the planet, and the equator will gradually shift to bring the excess mass closer to the equator. The planet still spins once every 24 hours, and true polar wonder won't affect the tilt of the Earth's spin axis relative to the Sun. But the redistribution of mass to the new equator does change Earth's poles, the points on the planet's surface where the spin axis emerges. Woodworth says the hotspot data from Hawaii provide some of the best evidence that true polar wonder was what caused the Earth's poles to start moving 12 million years ago. Island chains like the Hawaiians are formed when tectonic plates move across the hotspot. True polar wonder shouldn't change hotspot tracks, because the hotspot track is the record of the motion of the plate relative to the hotspot. Gordon says the change was only about a 3 degree shift but it had the effect of taking the mantle under the tropical Pacific and moving it to the south, and at the same time, it was shifting Greenland and parts of Europe and North America to the north. And this, he says, is what may have triggered what we call the Ice Age. Mind you, Earth is still in an Ice Age, which began about 3.2 million years ago. Earth's poles have been covered with ice throughout the age, and thick ice sheets periodically grow and recede from the poles in cycles which have occurred more than a 100 times the last ending about 15 to 20,000 years ago. During these glacial cycles, ice has extended as far south as New York City and Yellowstone National Park. The Earth today is in what's called an interglacial period in which the ice has receded towards the poles. Gordon says true polar wonder is not merely a change in the location of Earth's magnetic poles. As the planet spins, its iron core produces a magnetic field with north and south poles near the spin axis. The polarity of this field flips several times every million years, and these changes in polarity are recorded in the magnetic signatures of rocks all over the world. Paleomagnetic record, which is used to study the movement of tectonic plates across the Earth's surface, also contains many instances of apparent polar wonder, which tracks the motion of the spin axis and includes the effects of both plate motion and true polar wonder. He says Earth's mantle is ever-changing, as new material constantly cycles in and out from tectonic plates. The drawing down and recycling of the crust through subduction provides a possible explanation for the highly viscous mantle anomalies that probably cause true polar wonder. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 